Hello everyone, welcome to <coughs> excuse me, this morning's episode. Hopefully my voice is loud and clear. The title of the episode is Go Forth and See What Life is Like. And I want to speak about a concept. Where how would I say it? Our whole life, our whole world, uh, in some sense, moves in our sight. It is our sight. We look at life, and as life moves, we move in its image. The child, in some sense, <coughs> has no idea of personhood. It sees persons and becomes a person. And the issue is that children instantly can learn from other human beings how to be a human being, but they learn to a point where it is as far as the others have gone. And so for, for me, it's kind of like <clears throat> anytime you are doing something, Excuse me. Pretty much any time you're doing, I don't know how to say it, like, the moment I wake up, I notice my sight being the position of the location of the world. And I notice that my attention and my breath hold my position. So for me, it's as if my breath holds my body in, in some sense <clears throat> and my attention holds my mind. And so the body is this complex, you know, you can say bio-machinery, <laughs> this sort of the body systems, the things the body does we are so lucky that we don't have to think about it. It naturally happens. Imagine you had to think for, about your heart in order for it, to, for it to beat. Imagine you had to think about your lungs in order <clears throat> for yourself to breathe. These are natural processes. Nature is kind of like how the universe is thinking before you are. Sorry guys, I keep getting interrupted on this side. I just want to simply point that we are creatures that our sense of life has known dimensions and unknown dimensions. The unknown dimensions are given freedom to move in our inner realms. The known dimensions are not given that much freedom of movement. If you want to move something in front of your eyes, you physically have to do it. But if you want to move something behind your eyes, your attention, you have to move your attention. And you have to get a sense of your attention. 
There are some things that are, in some sense, uh, abilities of the human being, but they're taken so f for granted that they're left dormant. If you think about it, when we were in the jungle, <clears throat> when we were before the concrete jungle, when we were in the actual jungle, We had access to a level of savageness and intensity and reflex-based uh, coordination. <clears throat> that it's as if like from this high intensity, high cost life, we came towards a more gradual, more in our own control kind of life. You know, I find it interesting. <clears throat> there was a time in history where people wished they could just stay, you know, in some sense they could not work. There was a time. There was a time where it was as if it was more happening outside of the person's home than inside of the person's home. But now life has reached its peak, where by nature, <laughs> by nature's command, just the sense of this quarantine, we're all kind of <coughs> directed inwards. It's like, there was a time we couldn't stay um, inside. Now there's a time where we can't stay outside. Somebody once said, this life doesn't have an answer, but it has endless questions. And what that means is we constantly wake up and there is even the gap of deep sleep that in some sense time becomes crucial. The only reason we have creatures have in some sense paid attention <clears throat> to time is because there was a change of environment. I'm telling you the most crucial factor about our psychology, even when you look at good, evil, the connotations of those words, the imagery ascribed to them, it's all the game of light and darkness. Imagine being an evolutionary creature and endlessly getting a tan, endlessly having light emerge and then darkness fall, then light rise, then darkness fall, then light rise, then darkness fall. It's as if the pattern is set in, in, in some sense in the nature of the mind. I remember I was watching this show, uh, this Japanese show, I think it was One Punch Man, like an episode of that or something. And <clears throat> in the episode there was this character, this white-haired kind of character and the character in his childhood the character was a bad guy but in his childhood it showed him kind of watching the tv show and <clears throat> the tv show of heroes <clears throat> and the, this kids were like why don't the villains win why don't the bad guys win and i thought about that and i thought how interesting is life that in some sense leo tolstoy brought our, brought our attention to this in the sense that uh, in the Russo-Japanese War, the Russian Tsar was saying God is with us and the Japanese 
emperor was saying like it's with us you know every everybody thought the universe was with them but on some level they were blindly and savagely taking from the world that they saw <clears throat> there are certain situations where for defensive me measures the person's uh, offensive energy intensity may increase there has been times I remember I was a defend uh, defender <coughs> in like I've, I've Pretty much in, in soccer, I, I either played defense or the striker because I couldn't run the whole, like, the whole, what do you call it, the whole field, you know. <clears throat> and so I remember there were certain moments where uh, I, was, I, I was a defender, my brother was a goalkeeper. This was a far school, I have a twin brother. And um, he was the goalkeeper, I was the defender. And there was <clears throat> a bunch of other just classmates, you know. And there was a situation where in that moment, I was using the same intensity as I would go and strike goals, you know, score goals. I would, in some sense, I was very fast. Guys, in my youth, I was like, if you were playing soccer against me, I, I, I could probably, you couldn't get the ball. From me. <clears throat> but I'm telling you this that it was a situation where the same energy that I would use in an offensive mode, I was using defensively. It was just the object was changed. That means really it doesn't matter where you put the soccer player. Let's say you take one soccer player, even the goalie. <clears throat> it doesn't matter where you put them. You put them in one position, they will after some point exert the best effort they have, but then they're limited by their skill. And this life kind of gives gives people different perspectives. There's some people who they are born where they are physically strong, but internally weak. They have weak characters, but externally they, they appear strong. There are those who externally appear weak and internally they're strong. They have strong characters, you know. <clears throat> and there's all the other variations in between. What I realized that pretty much because of this light, this I, I call it the on and off switch effect on the psychology of the human being. Pretty much evil is when the sun went down, good is when the sun came up. I mean, it's so obvious. <clears throat> and so it's the same with our breathing. When we hold our breath, it's like, it's like a feeling of like, I feel the sun is going down. When I kind of I breathe, it's like <gasps> fresh air. It's as if light beams are entering the lungs. <laughs> I'm being poetic here, but you know what I mean? <clears throat> You know, at first, uh, Rumi has this quote, oh my God, I should share this. He said, when I was younger, I wanted to change the world. When I got older, now that I'm older, I want to change myself. <coughs> because the world is never just preserved in one person's eyes. You know, no one person can be like, yo, this world I see is the only world that's there. I mean, like, really? then why do we have so many eyes? Why did nature design so many ways to look at it if it's meant to be only seen in one way? Do you see this is why belief systems are unnatural? So the fact that human being has faith is the only supernatural thing in a changing world. <clears throat> So, um, I don't really understand the comment in the chat section, but I, I would say that, um, let me tell you, they came to Diogenes, this Greek philosopher, and they said, Diogenes, where are you a citizen of? And the guy was expecting Diogenes to be like, I'm the citizen of this great nation, of this great place, and this great, and everything's great, you know? <clears throat> and suddenly, Diogenes looks at the man. And Diogenes says, you want to know where I'm from? 
I am a child of the Cosmopolites. I am a citizen of the Cosmopolites. We will transcend colors drawn on, on map, on, on dirt. We will move beyond invisible walls in our heads and we will re access a civilization that is advanced. Right now, it's kind of like, here's the situation. Uh, <clears throat> we are not an advanced civilization, but we can see its potential. And now it's kind of left for a free-for-all until 2050, where in 2050, Ray Kurzweil, this futurist, this notable man of science, he has in some sense suggested that there will be super intelligence. Now, nobody knows if it's going to be then. Nobody knows if it's even happening now. But I'm just saying there's a point where we're going to kind of reach an ability to create something, on the, a mechanism on this planet that updates itself faster than we can control. You know, life is becoming such an interesting time in 2020 that it's like we don't have only... <clears throat> kind of like the past to consider, which is where religion, um, it's where a lot of our knowledge has come from, you know? You know what it's like? It's like our civilization. It's like you driving a car, but you only driving. It's like, imagine you want to drive forward, but you're looking at your rear window, rear view mirror, right? The past is like the rear view mirror. When you look at it, you notice what's there, you notice kind of what's behind you. <clears throat> but in some sense, you're meant to be in the system to look forward. And I am telling you, so many days of human advancement and exploration are in some sense die out in silence. <clears throat> the first thing that needs to occur is a revolution in the activities of society. That means it's not easy right now to suddenly change like a whole system, but you don't, you never change the whole system. The system is the sum of its parts. That means just look at it. You know, there were people who didn't care about technology. There were so many people who thought technology was going to ruin our lives, but so many people on YouTube are watching videos. Do you know what I mean? That means it's like we have access greater data, but at, but at a cost of our human nature. Pretty much, I, I, I just want to comment that we are creatures of sight, and this sight displays itself as something being observed and something observing it. We tend to make the major subject of life the self. <coughs> I feel there will come a time where self will be indistinguishable, inseparable from uh, society. Where how you are yourself is how you are your society. Sometimes it's life is like chess, as a piece at the beginning of the game may not make sense until seven moves later. You know, for me, here's the thing, the whole issue of civilization, the main reason why every other species pretty much has been man has managed to kind of collectively <coughs> synchronize to a rhythm. When you look at birds, they fly together. You know, you look at bees, they buzz together. <laughs> <coughs> Guys, here's a silly joke that I'm, I'm going to attempt to make on the this, on this spot, you know? <laughs> I don't think the joke's going to work, though. I wanted to say this person hears the door, something from those electronic doors. You know what they call it? Like some houses from that, like outside of the house, you... How am I forgetting this? Um, the door alarm is also like a two-way comm, okay, two-way communication device. <clears throat> so, 
it's like the person's like, who's buzzing? Who's buzzing? You know, and then the guy goes, sees there's just a bunch of bees. And that's the end of the joke, guys. The bees were buzzing. <laughs> they were buzzing the house alarm. <laughs> <coughs> the house bell or whatever. Yeah, that's, that was the joke. Anyways. <sighs> Whatever, guys. <laughs> Random joke in the middle of a serious talk. But anyways, what I'm saying is simply that you're a creature of your attention. Don't fear your attention. Don't fear your energy. You'll never you be able to work with it if you fear it. Anything you fear, you're not touching. Anything you don't care about, you avoid. Anything you don't look at, you in some sense never witness. And so our eyes are strange. It's as if the body is like uh, the destiny is is there, but the mind is not. And you see, the mind is man. The mind of man has the potential to surpass extinction, to find strategies beyond extinction. I feel that we are so caught in our past that the future generations are just going to be born and be like, "Oh my God, what are these guys doing? Still looking at the past? Don't they see what's coming in the future?" <clears throat> For me, it's um, now is a time where we're still playing costume games as a species. That means we are obsessed about the precision of the individual. We're all trying to be like perfect individuals. We're all going towards knowledge that's like, oh, yo, how do I become more perfect? How do I want to become more perfect? How do I go and get this, 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 this certificate to become this much perfect and that perfect? And we've built a society on perfection, but nobody's perfect, living perfect lives doing the attempt for that perfection. And that that's an inefficient system where you're building something for the future only to realize in some sense that you missed out on the journey to get to it. Now, of course, some inventions do take sacrifice, but we want to change that. And the opportunity is with the global community. The most we have to create a conscience for civilization. We have to create a network. And what that means is, it, 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 how is it? Imagine you had an idea and this idea went in front of like a gladiator, went into some global digital gladiator arena and it, cha it was challenged by other great ideas. I want to make a col coliseum. I pretty much, I don't know guys, but I feel this is the smartest thing we can do. We create an event that all people in history will know. And what I mean by that is that we are, it's an, how can I tell you, a lot of life is projection. So like, even though these words are projection, projected, but their blueprint is behind the eyes. And the way I will tell you very easily, this is an image. Behind your eyes, it's strange. It's like an art gallery that, that moves by the whim of the attention. So I'm telling you, human beings are different. I was in my youth, I didn't have access to an image oriented inner realm. That means I wasn't even conscious. Like thoughts came when they came and if I, that was it. But then there came a time where I wondered about my mind, but I did not attempt to kind of like, in a mess, like try to truth, you know, like the word brutalize. Imagine the word you make, you infuse the word brutalize and truth. So truthalize. You know, <laughs> so it's like a brutal way of trying to see truth, you know, so that's what, let's create that word, truth of lies, you know. Somebody's got to do it, guys, somebody. <laughs>
who doesn't realize they are not a thought and not language, the environment will program you. Simple. Your attention is the most valuable thing. And let me tell you guys, this is the difference between different types of sanity and insanity. <coughs> now I'm just going to give a quick comment on this because it's something I witnessed when I was um, like I'm a graduate of Toronto Film School and when I was there downtown I would be smoking my cigarette kind of looking at downtown Toronto and it was like it was both like like I could tell you exactly how the outside of downtown Toronto was inside the classroom it was like <laughs> It was like similar nature. I can't tell you how much the environment brushes up on, brushes off on the morality of you and me. We have to create beautiful cities, geometrically magnificent, and hopefully that will happen. You know, there definitely needs to be a revolution in our uh, architecture, <clears throat> and I'm going to try to start one in regards to interior design. But anyways, guys, um, Ah, go forth and see what life is. It may not be what you think your sight was. Lao Tzu tells us you must let go of who you are now to be who you, will, who you are meant to. What does that mean? That means you are a changing human being. Learn to accept that or suffer the consequences. And what a changing human being means that you are found in the relationship of a self in a world. Okay, there's a self in a world. Now, check this out. If the world moves quicker than the self, you don't have free will. If the self moves quicker than the world, you have free will. I would say free will is not something like an object to have or not have. Free will is a state. I'll give you an example. Somebody, for example, you see this in the, in the revolutions of many countries, guys. Like, hopefully one day I, I would like to go into history. Like, um, I hope I make friends with some good historians in the future. Because I want to have, uh, how can I tell you? The way history is planted is that it's like not only an object could have multiple ways to be seen. Not that just history is written by the winners. It's just that sometimes, regardless of who wrote history, we want to see the psychology of an environment. I am like one of those psych uh, psychologists, guys, who's, who maybe walks in the halls of an uncommon school of thought. Because for me, sociology is the psychology of a species in, in, an, in one environment. <clears throat> for me, I, I see all brand, knowledge is all branches and all these branches come to the same trunk. And the trunk is ultimately unknown. That means when you look at a tree, imagine we started from the tip of the branch and then we, 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 re, we reverse back down. We came to the trunk and we're like, oh shit, all knowledge has a singular source. And we go to the singular source and then we realize the singular source, the roots of the tree are in a soil that unless we dig the soil, as Carl Jung wanted to make the unconscious conscious, we will not figure out or in some sense we have to acknowledge that we can't see. So it's like that situation where you see the value of a belief compared to the value of direct experience. A belief is like this. Imagine somebody standing in front of you. You don't see what's behind you. That guy looks at you and he's like, hey man, there's a flying elephant behind you. <clears throat> and you are like, and you are, you, you haven't turned around to see if there's a flying elephant behind you or not. And you're like, I don't believe it. And then you say, I believe it. Imagine someone says, I believe it. Someone says, I don't believe it. 
but none of those two people are closer to the truth. The only person who's closer to the truth is that the person who hears the information then goes to look for himself to see what's up. Some treasures in this life I only found when I dared to look at things through my own eyes. And it's, 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 very, it's a strange feeling at first. That means when, if you feel like a stranger in the world, you, you, like a military general, you must use that as an advantage. The advantage of, in, in some sense, that is, is seeing the other side. All the moments in life where I feel pushed, separated, like I, I've pretty much experienced different kinds of like <clears throat> um, interactions with crowds. Of course, I haven't been, I haven't given that many public talks, but like, I can say I've given like, you know, in small groups. And... The psychology of the environment eventually commands universal teachings to have a priority over humanized teachings. That means right now we are, <clears throat> um, we have mastered objective movement. We have to some degree mastered some sort of subjective movement, uh, especially when we write, you know. Sometimes it's a, it's a cool thing, a person can literally get a pen hold the pen in your hand and literally put an empty piece of paper in front of you and whenever you get a thought, write it down. Just write down your thoughts and eventually you'll notice you're becoming conscious of the style that your mind presents thought to you. Sometimes you gotta push the curtain to see that the curtain never was there. It was it, it, some some jokes were funny because the beginning never existed. Sometimes, and <clears throat> I had one dream, it was a uh, kind of like semi-lucid dream, semi, I use the word lucid, I mean, it was just pretty much I was aware of the dream, I could move in the dream. Anytime I move in the dream, I just categorize that as a different kind of dream, the, the dreams where I'm automatically just moved as, as, as part of the film. You know, it's strange, it's like when the person goes in bed, closes their eyes, and then they naturally fall asleep, what really happens, <clears throat> it's kind of like the mind steps out of the objective simulation, then it's in this space. Then, if need be, it projects itself in a subjective simulation. I literally feel we are higher dimensional, perhaps. Perhaps our minds are rooted in a sort of attributeless higher, higher dimension where we have access to two sort of dimensions. We are at the intersection of a horizontal and vertical dimension, let's say. I feel that's where consciousness is really happening. Because the dream state is strange. When you, when you wake up in your conscious waking state and you move around, what do you notice? You notice that your body dictates your mind, primarily. <clears throat> that means the body's physical movement, it's, it's as if it's like you can move just like the dream state, but instead the dream doesn't change. So you can say when you're awake, it's as if you're like in a dream that doesn't randomly change. So you can say the conscious waking state is a state of being. It's pretty much when you wake up in the day, you're meant to express as the human design. And right now our species is so bent up of, of, on everything making sense that we have lose sight of the unknown. And so strangely, the only expression I see in society, you know what it is, it's like people are willing to throw others under the bus just for them to feel as if they, are, they got further. It's a messed up society, guys. I'm not joking. <laughs> but, but, it doesn't mean <clears throat> that the balance is lost. 
That means there is something about will. There's something about free will that it's a powerful force. You know, somebody once asked the question, <clears throat> who deserves to win? Who's the winner? Who deserves to win in, in any game? Imagine we were universally wondering. Doesn't matter if you were on this planet. Imagine there was a planet, like you were on the moon of Jupiter as a different kind of species, humanoid species, whatever. Like, You have to go forth because that going forth is a declaration of momentum. I'm going to share with you guys something because it's such a rare memory and it's something that I feel if I don't share it, I might forget it just myself. <clears throat> but guys, in 2016, there was an event that took place where I, I, was, I was in Iran. And I was in uh, my family's house. And in that situation, it was, I don't know how to tell you what it was like. I, I, I found myself in a moment where I had a sort of attack, breathing attack, like some sort of panic attack. Not a panic, random panic attack. There was some incident that was going on. But in the incident, I reached a point where I literally felt I was mismanaging my breathing and my anger. My anger was making me not be conscious of how intensely I was breathing and the stress of the panic mixed with the stress on, on, the, on, on the breathing. So I found myself for a second <clears throat> just on the kitchen, not like a, it wasn't like a, like a heart attack or stroke or anything. It was just this, this, this sudden shortness of breath that made me kind of, for a second, I just leaned myself. I just, I didn't fall on the ground. I just laid down on the ground to have less gravity acting on my body. And I was just like slowly trying to breathe. And for a second, there was, I don't want to say there was like my breath, there was no air, but I was, I went into a semi phase of shortness of breath. Okay, like the semi, I don't know, kind of like, there was just shortness of breath. And there was in that moment, that kind of silence where you've held your breath. Like you, sometimes you, those people who put like as a kid, I would hold my breath underwater playfully, you know. I just fell for a second and that moment there was this fear. You know how sometimes a person gets this fear of they don't know what's going to happen? And it's like suddenly that kind of fear set in and in my mind, in my mind playfully, I don't have kids, but like in my mind playfully, I felt as if like presence wise there were two beings there standing and there was just this instant image as if I felt like, I don't know, like for, for, for that second, guys, this is just like, I'm just sharing something that I experienced, you know, <laughs> this is kind of like just <clears throat> for archival reasons, I'm sharing this, guys, but I literally felt like this, my son and daughter which I don't have kids, but in the future, it was as if like there was something there that felt to me more important than me. And that took me out of my own suffering when I noticed something more important than me. And I instantly suddenly found my strength and stabilized myself. So that's the thing. Anytime you feel you don't deserve what is actually important for you, you, you're, you, you become inefficient and weak. So it's like, this is kind of like how you know yourself as a human being. Even I with Mr. Uthman would say, just like get a piece of paper, get a pen. You know, first of all, bow to the pen like a Japanese samurai bowing to, to their sword. <laughs> <clears throat> you know.
and ask yourself an honest question. Sometimes a person can do that, you know. Sometimes you can, in some sense, find a moment where you are alone and simply with yourself in the world and ask yourself a question and honestly try to answer it as if you don't know. But you're just trying to figure it out. <clears throat> you don't know how much humility keeps one in the context before the concept solidifies. It's like an elemental symphony. It's literally like me, all human beings have woken up in, in a song. But this song is a song of materialistic movement. It's as if strangely, maybe we don't hear it in our dimension, but maybe when, when a human being, literally the elements of a human body collapse, maybe there is a song, maybe there is a music that comes from that that we can't hear. But in other dimensions, there are tears for those who try, tried. Go forth and see what life is. You never know. And you never know even who you are. Do you know how many situations I thought I was like, yeah, you know, let's ride into battle. I know what I'm doing. Only for me to fall off that horse. Only for me to see, no, some moments you have to let the moment be the teacher. That took me, that was the most important thing. To find a way, I could not just accept myself. That's easy. You can accept yourself instantly in the mirror. It, but it was accepting the world that that self saw. That took a lot harder. And there came times where I couldn't accept it. And there are some things happening in this world where I still won't accept to the last day I'm here. But there are some things that I saw that could change in a second. And I never finished what I was saying, but when I was in downtown Toronto, pretty much smoking a cigarette, I was seeing human character, and I pretty much saw this, what appeared to be like this crazy person shouting at like a building. I had never seen someone shout at a building. You know what I mean? It was like the guy was mad at, I don't know, some either a reflection in the mirror in the window of the building he saw or like something. The guy was angry at right? <clears throat> And But the guy was oblivious to what was outside of him. And it was as if he had failed so many times that he felt he didn't deserve the outer realm, so he had let go of the organized mind. You might not understand it, but civility has to be introduced constantly. You know what that means? That means, for example, I noticed this is one, one interesting thing I can share about Persian culture which I witnessed in my upbringing, when someone in a gathering would get upset or there would be an issue, everybody in the gathering, including the host and even the guests, and everybody would, the host would instantly come. Imagine like a fight happened or something bad happened. The host would come, the host, the person who's, it's like, it's like his party, his gathering. The host would come and immediately put the mind of the guest at ease. That means there are some hosts that they are not literally those people, they, they, they are not hosts. They don't care about the guests. But there are some hosts where the guest is like a living being. You know what I mean? When you see people as human beings, then you'll be like, oh snap. Was I seeing my own biases reflected through this other person's face? <laughs> you know? <clears throat> I have loved and hated so much in this world that after some point I'm like, what am I loving? What am I hating? <laughs> it's, you know, it's like, I think I know. I run and suddenly I see the world has changed and I look at the sky and I'm like, you got me again, changing universe. <laughs> you got me again, evolution. I thought I knew. I thought I had found the box that truth was in. Only to see that beyond language, our minds are open. There are fields of being. We are energy before we are man. And the laws of energy are not lost to us. They are just not humanized. That means there are so many ways we can exist, so many states of consciousness accessible that let's say you're a person who has nothing, okay? Let's say you're somebody in a third world country hearing me and you have literally nothing. You literally have nothing. You just have a place you're living in, okay? Let me tell you how advanced your mind is. Do you know you can sit down <coughs> but still experience movement in your inner arms? Sometimes when I hear beautiful music, 
it's like it's like a film behind my eyes. I could tell you that a great song, any music you have heard in your life, it would that song was great if it at some point made you kind of feel you are reliving a memory or it pushed you into your inner realms. And then you'd be like, yo man, I love that song. And you, technically you don't love the song, you love how that song made you be in that moment. By the way, welcome to the chat section, everyone. Uh, feel free to share, comment, and you know, as usual. You can, uh, like the ancient philosophers, scribe anything on the wall of this chat section. Yeah. Anyways, guys, <clears throat> the topic at hand is, is very crucial because we can't avoid the fact that there is new eyes popping out every moment. Do you know everything I'm saying, all those children that will be born, who will, if they hear my voice, you know how many versions of my talks will echo? But these talks are not mine. That's the power. That's the power I realized because there were some stories, guys, that found me early that made me become content with the idea that there is no legacy greater than the continuity of the human vision. There is no legacy greater than the continuity of the human vision. There is no legacy greater than the continuity of the human vision. And the human vision is not a personality. We are all dots, kind of, and time is like this arrow forth. And every person alive is kind of like a frame in the film of the, how long the universe is kind of projected, you know? Right now, we must find the mysteries, we must find the questions. So I will say, whoever right now is seeking for truth, do not seek the answer now, seek the question. Try to see what the right question is. <clears throat> it's a strategy that they say, if they make you ask the wrong question, they don't have to worry about your answers. That means, imagine, <clears throat> you realize like this store has this last ice cream, imagine. Okay, and so you are going, you know, with someone and you're right in front of the door and somebody comes and asks you, hey man, is this door open? And you tell the person no. Imagine you say no. And then the person leaves, the person believed you and leaves. And then you, for example, go and get the ice cream, the last ice cream. So I'm saying it, it, it <laughs> I'm not saying like that, I'm just saying that I just, that's a random example. Okay, there's no such thing as last ice cream ever, you know? <laughs> <clears throat> there's always backup, guys, you know? Maybe there's cones, though, maybe the last ice cream cone, I don't know. But whatever, guys, I'm just saying that. There is way more to life than how it appears, and you will only figure that out if you choose to see what your honest eyes look like. There was a time where I was like, sure, it's super easy trying to be something else, but what am I? And then I realized I have one lifetime, not only to learn from others, but to learn from myself. And when you learn from yourself, you experientially update yourself. When you learn from others, you indirectly and conceptually update yourself. <clears throat> you metaphorically up update yourself. A metaphor is like seeing truth in the life of something that is not true. The reason I chose this picture <clears throat> is not to promote the sales of brooms in the world, <laughs> but to say that, I mean, this is some like fictional situation because the girl has what is this the girl has like cat ears so technically the girl is a cat there is a cat on the broom I think technically the way the broom is guys it can't hold her weight so it's a force field, so technically she doesn't even need the broom to float. You know? <laughs>
the elements of the world are moving and you are moving as them. Your eyes open, the world appears. The day occurs, events happen. You fast forward through them. As we look back, there is a sort of abyss. Man fears what he feels will control him. Therefore, cruelty will continue as long as man fears the control from the outer realms. But what the insight of the Buddhic mind would say was that, oh, you human being, have you not chosen your name? Have you not chosen to be the shapes that you see in the world? And so whether you make a decision or not, decisions will be made. That is nature's law. All must go forth. So in some sense, if you do nothing or you go do everything, all will go forth. The, these two words, go forth, there is no stronger. There is nothing that terrifies chaos when order goes forth. And it's vice versa as well. And order will be in some sense frightened when chaos doesn't back down. And so life is filled with forces. When I was young, um, there, me and my brother, when I was really young, like seven, we would play these kind of like, we had these characters we would make either from like stuff we would find or my, my father would buy these kind of like Lord of the Rings mini miniature characters and we would in some sense kind of imagine. And I was ever since my childhood, my brother would always go towards the warrior and I would always go towards the mage. And the reason was because for me the concept of like literally what is now popularly known as like the airbender thing the elements controlling the elements seem to me the ultimate power. That man, he is trying to control the environment. And that's what cyberspace, the evolutionary urge towards cyberspace culture is. Man is trying to become, trying to not, let's say it's not that even man wants to be God. Man wants to look through God's eyes. So cyberspace culture will allow that. And all those people who are controlling, they are trying to be gods of their moment. Even you see it, even in, in, in courtship, or you can say, you know, in <laughs> sexual psychology, sometimes it's that the value of the self is different, and that value shifts in accordance to the activities. You know, the false thing is that we think uh, the concept of identity is one dimensional. We are kind of trying to say everything is matter, but wait a minute, who am I? <laughs> you know, it's like, wait a minute, are electrons hallucinating humanhood, or could it be that we, 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 we find ourselves in receptive states? I can tell you, I have way more freedom behind my eyes than in front of it. But in front of it, there is a texture and joy to the quality of physical existence. So when you don't fear the unknown, you see the tools at your disposal. So I'm, Mr. Within is saying, the moment you realize the unknown, you are the unknown of, to the unknown, you will, you will be fascinated when you realize your own strength. So guys, my attention came on the chat section. Nice, it's popping. Um, What can I say, guys, really?
I'm telling you, experience is beyond language. We have been conditioned to think in stories. We're not just storytellers. <laughs> we are... We are not just storytellers. We are story experiencers. We experience the stories we perceive. And all these stories arise from what you feel the context is. I mean, really, guys, you got to think about it, that human beings, we're not perfect creatures. We're not like an AI machine. We, our brains are not connected to like an ultimate database. We are creatures that have a space of proximity. So I want everyone listening, treat your mind as if the moment you wake up, you are in the presence. You are in the presence of the light of your mind like a candle and your body like the wax biological wax is burning now i looked at life and i saw history guys like it was strange sometimes when i've kind of looked at history i felt as if i've i've ascended towards the sky and as if i'm just an aerial view as if a camera thrown by like zeus like a lightning into the air and the camera's filming backwards you know? <laughs> I had this aerial view and suddenly I saw the surface of the earth and then I saw a fast forwarding of all human activity and I saw how much disconnection there has been, how many secret hidden lives of people there has been and for the first time we have found a way to give the life behind our eyes a voice in front of our eyes. So for me technology is the is an is a step towards the multidimensional and just think about it right life is pretty much i say there's a bunch of axes if you can if you acknowledge these axes you become a pilot of your plane of existence so i'm speaking to you believe it or not underneath everything i say on these talks i'm speaking to you at as first a designer then as a pilot i'm speaking to these sort of personas to you because I feel those are the most important archetypes. I have a strange respect. That means anybody who listens to this talk, if you see designers and pilots in this world, just salute them. Salute them or bow to them like a samurai. <laughs> Because there's, there's this incredible feeling when you feel you are participating in a value that is echoing beyond the limits of uh, how far reality has moved in your inner realm. You know, guys, I'm going to give you, I've given you like a few examples. <coughs> Sorry, guys, just a second. I got to change the music in the background. Pretty much, I've given you here. I remember, I'm going to share with you certain memories, certain experiences. And hopefully in these experiences, you can, from the sidelines, perceive how one human being has engaged uh, the animation of the inner realms. There has been moments where I saw something ahead and I knew what the right decision was. <clears throat> but the issue was I wasn't in the right self, so I didn't trust myself. So I remember there was a situation where I gave my comment and I was this shy person in the situation and people were like, no, that's wrong. Then literally it became that. It became exactly what I saw. And then I noticed people are more prioritizing self-expression over actual 
precision of what's going on. Most people are looking at life and seeing what they want to see rather than actually seeing what's there and then letting the inner realms animate. So <clears throat> I noticed that <clears throat> the world can be a fool and sometimes you can be a fool in the world. Both are possibilities, you know. A mighty wisdom passes through both those gates. So that was a moment where I didn't trust myself. I didn't trust my mind. I didn't trust the externalization of my mind, the external expression of my mind, the external movement. I thought the world knew more, more than me. But it was only when I realized it's not about what the world knows. And then I asked myself, what do I know? And that question hit me like hard, guys. Like, you know, I've been in physical fights in my life and in my youth. And nothing had hit me harder than this question. I asked myself, who is looking through my eyes right now? And I honestly didn't know. And I realized it can't be a thought because every time I ask the question and answer it, there's a new thought. Thoughts come and go. So the, it's not only the cells of your body, as scientists, biologists suggest that ch it changes every two weeks, the cells of your body, the cells of the brain, maybe years, <coughs> some cells of the brain. <clears throat> but the cells of the biological body change every two weeks. That means that when you look at your physical body and you look at pictures of yourself like 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you would be like, yo, I was somebody else. You know, who was that kid that I used to be? <laughs> so then there came situations where I understood my own intelligence and I trusted it. So that was an example in my life where I saw something deeper into the moment, but I didn't trust the self. I didn't trust my being. I didn't trust my, uh, that I, I, it's like I knew, but I didn't trust that I knew. <clears throat> and then something unique happened. After certain experiences, I became, I went through a phase of strange preferencelessness. And it was this strange state where, <clears throat> I don't know how to tell you, like, my, my uh, family, it's like a lot of my, f I was friends with, like, I don't know how to tell you, a bunch of uh, Russian salesmen who were next level. And I had this sales job, and I had this kind of, Still same nature, but more of a arrogant ego. And I was also drinking and I didn't care about balance that much. It was only when certain things were denied when I was like, you know, it's like, this is the idea. A healthy body has to move in a healthy way. It should be able to move. Now we look at a healthy mind and a healthy mind should in some sense be able to externalize the proper thing. That means the fact, like it's not that desire is wrong, it's just that we don't have the externalization to meet its demand. <clears throat> that means if you desire something too soon, you got to wait. It's like, I'll give you an example. Imagine you want to go, uh, I'll tell you this, I'll give you an, a personal experience like... <laughs> Um, I had to go print the poster of this film that I wanted to produce uh, for this um, kind of uh, final, this, how can I tell you, important assignment for, uh, for the graduating year of my film school. And I had to go to Staples and coincidentally the Staples right beside my house was opened at 8 a.m. instead of 9 a.m. And I had to have this delivered. And I remember it was kind of like um, I didn't sleep that night. And so 
uh, it was a situation where I remember I realized that I was constantly checking the clock. I was kind of in the sense of like, okay, time move faster. I gotta get work done. <laughs> it's like time. Why are you moving so slow right now? <laughs> But then I noticed that it's an ability to relocate your attention from the object it's on. That means when I look at this coffee cup, guys, like so many people don't understand why there's something called a Zen tea ceremony. Some people are going to be like, Mr. Within, tea? Are you talking about tea right now? <laughs> and I'll be like, okay, if you don't like tea, it could be coffee. <laughs> but Zen masters, they had this thing where it was mindfulness. And this mindfulness is so key to writing too, in communication and writing. And the mindfulness was that when you are drinking a cup of tea, when you are pouring the water of the cup of tea, you're not thinking of drinking the cup of tea, you're just pouring. When you've poured the cup of tea, you just think of holding it. When you hold the cup of tea, it's, it's like every action is done and then the attention moves on mindfully from it. But so many people, their desires make them want to just jump at things so the attention becomes fragmented into multiple intensities of wanting something. So you got to kind of let yourself relax. <clears throat> there was something intense that back in the day, there was this thing where I remember my father told me this story. My father's family um, in Iran, they had this cottage in Damobad and my grandparents pretty much. It was my grandparents' cottage. And it was somewhere where my father and all my uncles and aunts, their childhood they had spent there. So many generations of our family had literally gone into that garden. And my father said when he was young, there was, there was, they had this security guard kind of, he had this small house at the edge of the cottage <clears throat> by the gate of the property. And there was a guy who, I think it was the guy's son. It was the security guard, Dash Gardner, and the security guard was also the gardener of the cottage. <clears throat> it was pretty much the, the security guard lived in the cottage. You know what I mean? But lived in, in a house outside of the cottage, protecting the cottage, you know? in Damoban, right? Here, let me, let me, let me see if I can find it, find it. Like, this is a mountain in Iran. So here's the mountain, guys. This is like, this is where the cottage was. It wasn't like on the top of the mountain. <laughs> but this was like, this, this mountain was like the area. Was like somewhere near this mountain was the cottage. Here, I think everyone sees it. This is in Iran. And yes, guys, that's snow on the top of that mountain. <laughs> And so this guy had come and this guy was like some, the son of the security guard, Dash Gardner, was like an addict. My father was telling me the story. He saw this event take place in his childhood. <clears throat> and my, my, like this story is coming from my father's childhood. You know what I mean? And 
there was a man who, in some sense, the son of the gardener, security guy, he was on drugs or something, some next level hard street drugs, and it was like messed up. And so what the father had done was come and ask like my father's, uh, the father of the, the security guard, what he had come and done was came and asked my grandparents, uh, this is during when my father's young, that if they're allowed, if he's allowed to kind of literally chain with a chain, chain his drug addict, like messed up drug addict kind of son, where the son wants it. The son came to the father and it's like, I got to get this out of my system. You got to chain me to this building, right? And so they chained, they chained this messed up like drug addict guy, you know? And when I say this, guys, this is harsh drugs, not like how Western culture has become. This is like messed up stuff in third world country streets, who knows? You know, developing country streets, like it's, some lives are hard in Western, it's like hard to see that a person living in Western civilization, then you fathom like certain third world countries and you're like, oh, oh, it's, it's even more messed up there. But anyways, so you see, <clears throat> you see this, that, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so how this? What happens is that they, the security guard, even the son, son, the sons come to this father and it's like, yo, you know, you gotta connect me to this thing. So pretty much that with they chained the kid, not not the kid, but like like the the it was like his like I don't know, late thirty year old son that he was kind of trying to. The gardener was like an old man or something, and and so the whole point was they they literally chained this guy to like this fence dash window, like metal fence window like thing, right? And so my father and the whole family is sleeping that night and imagine at late at night, everybody's sleeping in the house and you hear the shouts of this guy who's chained to the metal thing and kind of like hitting the thing, right? So just to get the messed up thing out of his system because here's the thing guys, you are what you put in your body. When you stop putting whatever you're putting in your body, you experience literally like, 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 like a, a new sense of your own body. <clears throat> so the system is you stop the process and you just let it be and you, you endure it, you know? And this is very hard. Like I've, in certain moments of my life, I personally, you know, there's been times where I've kind of, uh, uh, with, with, with intense, like, with intensity thrown lighters in the trash can. I don't know how to tell you. Anyways, guys, to go forth, <laughs> I could tell you this. I, I, I kind of gave you examples of moments where <clears throat> I didn't go forth, but I could see what life was like 
But some moments when I realized going forth literally means you got to trust the vehicle when you drive it. If you don't trust, like literally the religious faith, it's strange. Like I was like, why the, why was it like, I, I've, I've seen various religious personalities in this life <clears throat> and the religious personality is like, What can I say? It's like faith opens the door and then the way your mind is constituted receives experience thereof. <clears throat> so what I mean by that is the religious mentality was like you got to believe in it and then it becomes real. But they didn't say it, it becomes real. They just from the beginning said it's real. But then the secular mind comes and looks at stories and it's like, wait a minute, you telling me that there's a, there's a personality behind these stars, you know? <clears throat> and suddenly the mind ponders beyond the evolution of story. I personally feel we were object worshippers. We were literally like, like imagine back in the day there were a group of people, idol worshippers, okay? And these idol worshippers suddenly like from the clouds a light beam came and this light beam like the clouds parted and this light shined upon this chair <clears throat> so <laughs> these idol worshippers they see this chair in sunlight and they're like, yo, this chair is our God. This chair is our God. We found our God. You know, and they all go towards the chair and they're like, nobody's allowed to sit on this chair. And this Nobody can touch this chair. This chair is our God. And they all start bowing to the God, praying to this chair, praying for everlasting glory of this chair. <clears throat> then the guy who owns the chair comes and he's like, yo, guys, what are you doing? I need my chair back. And they're like, don't touch our God. <laughs> and the idol worshippers are like, no, this is our God. This is our truth. You cannot take our truth. And the guy's like, your truth is my chair. And I want to sit on my chair, bro. I need my chair back. <laughs> and so the chair was taken from man. The idols of man's worship were taken from him. <laughs> So, what do you think we went on after we were done with objects? After we were like, yo, could this object be true? Then somebody slapped that out of our hand. Nature's time slapped that out of our hand and was like, no, no, that object isn't God, man. Keep looking. <laughs> <clears throat> and then it becomes a situation where you realize we, after worshiping objects, we went on to worshiping subjects, and that's why, that's why, guys, I think I'm one of the very few people who's kind of caught on to this, and it's something fact fascinating. It's the evolution of language. What does that mean? That means after idol worship, we have all been languages, language worshippers till this far. And this is why free will and creativity and talent and all this stuff is, is very high value for our civilization. Do you know? <clears throat> it's kind of like we're using brushes now, but in the future we're going to realize we are the brushes that the cosmos is drawing upon itself. It's like somebody, somebody tells you, you know, um, <clears throat> where are you from, you know, or like, who's, who's your, uh, who's your great ancestor? And then you're like, it's like, buddy, the cosmos, what do you want me to say? <laughs> so what I'm saying is eventually we return to the collective. I feel ideology is in circular. I feel strangely, I, I'm writing this book, guys, hopefully it'll be out soon, it's called God Likes Spheres. I was like, whoa, why is there so many spheres in this world?
you telling me light from the sun is entering one orb to another. It's as if the spheres are communicating. The light is entering our eyes and worlds are being fathomed. The thing about going forth and seeing what life happens means that sometimes, sometimes in life, regardless of how much you plan, you just have to go along with the moment and see the evolution of the moment through. I can tell you wherever you are, don't fear your eyes. You can't really fear what you are, you just are it before you fear it. <laughs>For me, I see uh, the archaic morality was good versus evil, you know, evil forces, good forces, yay, you know. <laughs> but I feel the morality of the future is going to be incredibly advanced. It's literally going to be no longer good or bad. We're going to just see efficient actions and inefficient. Efficient actions simply win-win. Inefficient actions win-lose. And so win-win means that we have to be patient. Patient. That means sometimes in my life, I can't tell you guys, not having a desire made me see something better than the desire. So don't think desire is the point of life. Don't think it's just hedonism. Don't think you're just a battery that has to just at once just release all the energy. Sometimes in this life, we can pilot, we can navigate things, we can uh, move design, not with just our hand literally drawing design on a piece of paper, but in behind your eyes, how language moves, you can notice it. You can, you can see how image moves, you can see that there's a vitality, you can see that these atoms after four billion years have personalities, these complex constitutions. So it's strange because it's like, we're like, wait a minute, you're telling me I have free, I, free will is an illusion, and you are like, whoa, let me check this out, and you see, wait a minute, before the human idea, everything about the human idea was hollow and elusive. So before we existed, what, do you, what can there be? So your physical body is a blessing and it's literally an opportunity to experience multidimensionality. <clears throat> I'm telling you, you're, you it, it's like so many people feel it's, it's hilarious. They feel it's like metaphysics is different than physics. No, it's like after physics has looked at itself, when it wonders about the unknown, that's metaphysics. It's the, it's the more inclusion, inclusiveness of the unknown. <clears throat> so that means you got to let the world happen. I remember there was a time in my life where I wanted to do everything, literally. And then I realized it's impossible. I'm like, not, not even Shiva with all his hands could do this. And then I realized nature is the hand of humanity. I am telling you, you being simple and yet aware is better than being unaware and complex. And what awareness means is checking the weather. There is no such thing, guys, I'm telling you, as enlightenment. Not that there's no such thing, it's that when you reach that, it's not for a person. It, it, mysticism is when a human being has really played the games of human life to a point where they're like, what else? That's mysticism. <clears throat> it's like, this is why people, there were, some people were like, wait a minute, why is it that so many people who suffer, they, <clears throat> they suddenly go through towards spiritual and religious ideology? Just abstract. Why do people go? And then we realize hope was abstraction. Hope is abstraction. So the same abstraction we perceive God, we perceive the memory, we perceive all the names we've given all the elemental forms. <clears throat> I feel that the species is becoming conscious beyond its programming. We are like literally how AI is going to become self-conscious. That literally means the AI became aware of itself beyond the way we programmed it. 
So that has happened to us human beings. But it's more like the infusion of a dimension from the sky and a dimension from earth. <clears throat> in, in, in this book I've written, again, it's not, it's not published, hopefully. I can uh, get all this stuff out there before <clears throat> the breath decides to leave. But I'll, I'll say that... Um, This book I wrote called The Source of Language, I said your body is made of earth, your mind is made of sky. Just think about your mind ever present like the sky. Somebody comes and says, hey man, what is the mind? You're like, yo, are you trying to measure the sky? Are you trying to measure the sky right now? <laughs> so so that's, <laughs> that's the thing. <clears throat> we are just projections. We are our best effort possible. When you see a little kid, you can't judge that little kid based on like a, like a hundred year old man's wisdom. You see that child is just a child. Every human being has access to some range of reality and then you implement yourself, you know, you apply yourself. Something that the youth must be remember, it's just pretty much natural, is that the future generations, I think after three generations, it, it's like there's going to be a total shift of nature. And it's simply because we move from the familiar to the unfamiliar. That means all the stuff that is familiar for me now, my kids are going to probably in the future, I don't have kids, but I'm saying in the future, if I had kids, probably they would go towards uh, the unfamiliar. So it's as if it's like an ever expansion of the eyes of the species in trying to develop the languages that can uh, coordinate not just outer phenomenological experience, but inner phenomenological experience. I feel mathematics <clears throat> is um, going to give us um, an insight that will surpass any sort of correlating neurological movement to uh, coordinating neurological movement to like uh, psychology. That's pretty complex, really. That's really a complex thing. <laughs> so welcome to the chat section everybody um, you see guys there is this wisdom from Sri Ramana Maharshi this yogi where he says stop chasing and the silence be silent and the wisdom will find you so certain mystical schools of thought, they were like kind of Taoist, they were like, just do less, it'll find you. But the issue is, is that why do you want that wisdom to find you? That means if you want something of application, <laughs> you know, if you want something that's practical, it has to be experientially connected. If you notice, like at least it, it might communicate in my speech, most of the things I say and I remember, uh, th their vividness, a lot of the quotes I remember, because the moment I saw the quote, I saw an image of my own memory. So technically when I remember quotes and whatnot, I am remembering certain memories I had when I was saying the quote. <clears throat> You see, guys, we are, we are the human being. And when we become aware of our being, we feel the humanity is the effect. So if you feel the causes, you don't need to do anything about it. It's like, this is one thing I don't like. For me, the New Age community is like the same psychology as like a, a bunch of spoiled, you know, 
<laughs> spoiled kids, sons of billionaires who don't want to open the, you know, their box of pizza even. Somebody has to come and open their box of pizza. <laughs> I mean, that would be probably, like, billionaire level, no? <laughs> she wrote one more, she guys. Says silence is also a conversation. People are different. Um, what I'm speaking about is that, <clears throat> I, okay, here, this was what I was building up to pretty much. How I have gone forth in my inner realms and seen what life is like is simply that I was preferenceless and a thought so unique and strange from how my own thinking was to me arose. And I, the, the, the thought was so unique. This is the advantage of being humble. You suddenly see secret dimensions to, you know, the center of the earth. So being human, just to clarify in the chat section, I, 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 I like how you've written what you've written. What I disagree with is, is that we are, there is a kind of psycho psychology where it's the, I've kind of said, I got inspired by, okay, Isaac Asimov, he says violence is the last refuge of the incompetent. Anytime you see a violent human being, because that guy wasn't, that human being wasn't, Isaac Asimov is saying this, that human being wasn't intelligent enough to solve the problem without getting physical. That person just wasn't intelligent enough. You know, they were like literally like, I don't know, child level. Violence is very childish. Violence is like, you know, uh, it's as if the person is, hasn't realized after some point, you got to let go. You got to just prioritize your attention on different memories. <clears throat> that means it's like, we're not, we're, we are a multi-dimensional being. That means we experience our dimensions in multiple ways. Pretty much, guys, my experience with my inner realm was that I was preferenceless. Uh, I had a feeling there was an image. Uh, that I had I experienced something unfamiliar to my own private eyes. That means usually when people walk in a room, they feel they see everything. Right? But the situation is that it's multiple rooms simultaneously. So even if you see something in the room, you don't know in which dimension of the room you saw it. <clears throat> fear is, guys, fear, I remember in one of my talks, I said it was like fear kills a man before he has lived. And honestly, I was, oh, I, I, God, I'm opening up so many lines of thought really okay <clears throat> the last refuge of the ego uh wisdom is the last refuge of the ego wisdom wisdom has a has its own kind of uh after effects <laughs> and when i say wisdom that means noticing watching being mindful of the relationship of absence and fullness in your life for example when lovers in a relationship depart 
there is the absence of their psychological dependence on each other's emotions and acceptance. Like when you live with, with someone, you're living not just with that person, you're living with how that organism is being a human being. You're living with the potential of who you're living with. This is why relationships where the human, two human beings have been drawn to how each other animate as people uh, is more long-term stable than how they appear as people. Because appearances change based on circumstances change. I trusted a random, what, what felt to me the unknown. <clears throat> and when I trusted it, I noticed it's not, it's kind of like <clears throat> behind the door, holy shit, what's behind the door? But when you open the door and see inside it, you see it's just a room. So all human fascination for beyond the veil, it, 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 it may not just be your dreams, you know, it, it, it's, it could be that like an argument that if you were an eternal being, why do you need to survive in this world? So that's, that's the need for the secular filters upon social demand. That means human beings, they have different DNAs. That means even if we had this civilization that was under one ideology, imagine like Lord of the Rings style, but the worst outcome happened and what the guy Sauron got the ring and it's like, oh no, every, every, the world is, Middle Earth has become like Middle Toast. <laughs> <coughs> So many people give others freedom to be human beings, but they don't give themselves a freedom to be human being, a human being. And if only you could visualize time travel, you would instantly realize it. If I had a time machine, I would just go back in time and I'd be like, don't doubt yourself, you knew. And that's it. And I'd come and I'd leave, you know? I mean, guys, it makes sense that before we master time traveling technology, we must master invisibility so that when we time travel, we don't become objects of attack. <laughs> yeah. My inner realms, it began with writing. It began, believe it or not, I was raking leaves in my backyard and it was a sunny day. And I remember I was raking leaves because I, I was inspired by these kind of like martial, martial art movies, you know. I was just visualizing as if if I was back in the day and my weapon was like a stick, how would I fight with a stick? And then I thought in my mind, how would I teach myself fighting with a stick? And I started to just slowly with the least amount of energy, just rake the leaves. So I remember I was uh, the, I, I had the rake down really to the ground and I was holding the very edge of the rake and very slowly I was, <laughs> I was just trying out like a new system, new design, you yeah? And I remember while raking leaves, these lines of poetry came into my mind where all I remember from them was like the temple of compassion, like something, something, then enter the temple of compassion. And guys, I was raking leaves on a sunny day with tears in my eyes, but I wasn't like my nostrils were like occupied and it was like, uh, you know, uh, nostril cavities were wide open and I was smiling and there were tears coming from my eyes while I was raking leaves. It was like, honestly, one of those moments where I'm like, okay, even if I had a diary, I would be like, okay, maybe not tonight. <laughs> it was like too rat. <laughs> but I'm telling you, that was the thing. That it was a spontaneous entrance of something new that I felt was accessible in my inner realms and I cared for it. What you care for, it updates. What you don't, doesn't. 
And you have to, underneath all of that, recognize human beings. Literally, think of it this way. We have two brain hemispheres. Of course, the left and the right. The left is for the analytical attempts. The right is for the creative attempts as, as a creative urge. Right? We categorize it simply like that. And the right, so I don't know how many people know this, but the right hemisphere of your brain uh, uh, aligns the left part of your body. And the right side, the left part of your brain aligns the right side of your body. So if there's damage done to the brain on different sides, it has an influence poten uh, potential on, on the other side of the body. You know what I mean? So it's like literally <clears throat> our brains are zigging, za zigzagging, you know, throughout the body. <laughs> So imagine instead of left brain hemisphere, known brain hemisphere, unknown aspect dimension of mind, known dimension of mind. Now the known dimension of mind, that is called your past. And also it's lit, it's very active in the present. <clears throat> time is something that will change for the person. When you experience a moment where you feel before time this moment was there, you see a hollowness to the space-time continuum. That hollowness pushes you into a strange void of doubt. That strange void of doubt makes you the witness. So many people, as I'm speaking, they are aware of the witness. Any action you do throughout the day, you're witnessing it. Now, we are wondering about what is animating the free will. What is causing a person want to pick up an orange and then suddenly be like, no, I'm going to pick up an apple. And then the person suddenly changes their mind. What is the occurrence? For, for now, what I think is going on with free will is it's sequencing. And I got the clue from the code on the Matrix, in the movie Matrix, those green code that was coming vertically down. I got the clue from that, that on some level we have to utilize mathematics and geometry to find a way where it's like the crystallized version of all conceptual theorization ever so far. And I feel we have to link that finding to the human body. Believe it or not, you have to defend not just trees and forests from being bulldozered, but a technological future civilization forgetting its nature. For me, the whole point is like, all right, we're cutting down trees, building pavement. All right, all right. At least let's not forget that the trees were there. That is savage. That is the true cruelty. So I trusted a moment. I let the expression occur. Same way a baker trusts put it, mixing, making something with ingredients and putting it in the oven. That oven part is the trust. You trust the process. You work a little bit and then you watch how the universe behaves. You work a little bit you watch how the universe behaves. And after some point, you'll notice yourself, eons have gone by, and you have been walking, you have been crawling through life as a humble, simple, kind of breeze, invisible breeze. Only to realize that after the person has, in some sense, served for eons, they have, in some sense, gained the ability to command. Now, what is the concept of command? Most people feel a command is a bad thing. Like, literally, I think most people, when they see the command button on their keyboard, they're like, yo, is this button commanding me to press command? <laughs> <coughs> but a command is literally giving direction. So you can say literally you drawing a line on an empty piece of paper is a command. It's, it's, it's uh, um, the, the going forth part and trusting the unknown and seeing and seeing what life is like. That seeing what life is like part is the entrance of the novelty. So tr the caterpillar has to literally trust going into a cocoon and dismantling. 
Like what? Like that? How next? How enlightened they're accounted for those guys? They just go in a cocoon and they end it. And I think caterpillars are telling us how human life should, in some sense, maybe metamorphosize. So we we think right now that death is death. Ah, oh, lights up. But maybe, maybe if there is some sort of continuation or maybe Rene Descartes' idea that the mind is its own dimension and the body, maybe if simultaneously as I'm speaking right now, even though we experience ourselves as biological elemental creatures, we're also simultaneously behind, at the edge of every person's, behind every person's eyes, at the edge of that uh, inner space, it is in some sense the same attribute as command of the universal sector. So the concern is that we're on a rock in the middle of nowhere, just like how we discovered fire, we have in some sense sparked language. After some point we're like, yo, this object is no longer an object, that's called a coffee cup, that's called a computer, this is called a door. We started not worshipping language, but seeing ourselves as it. And that's why I feel the individual consciousness, the whole thing that neurologists kind of saying free will is an illusion. It's not that it's an illusion. It's that you, who, how is the illusion there? Do you see what I mean? The question echoes back because there's something unfamiliar. There's something strange, right? Why is it that the human species is suddenly so much more up to date? Why is it that when, when I go to work, I don't see faces of human beings that are like, evolutionary versions like right now if our faces are like the humanized version of like our chimp descent chimp uh, plus unknown descendant like you know what I'm saying <laughs> I'm saying that the world is kept literally an aura there is an aura of language that is the veil of thought that Alan Watts was talking about Life is its own painting. There's some moments I attend where I know I'm a guest in that moment. I literally know I'm not going to be there, <clears throat> you know? And it's kind of like that time where I think, you know, most people experience this, but I'm just vocalizing it. Where it's as if, like, let's say you're on a bus and you see, like, this very beautiful girl kind of come in and sit in the bus, you know? And you literally have to get off the next stop, you know what I mean? And you have no choice because you're late, you know what I mean? <laughs> so it was like a situation where in that moment, you just close your eyes and it's as if you just bask in the beauty you see. Some, some, some senses of beauty, they remain, they remain with you. But some, some senses of beauty, they're like literally you're just basking in a graceful moment of how your mind is infused with the other person's beauty, you know? The mind is so advanced that in some sense it is living a life while we're, we are existing. So think of it, I'll give you, I'll tell you how I came to this conclusion. It was that I had a dream where I moved in the dream. As I moved in the dream, I experienced literally, wait a minute, so I can move left and right. I woke up from the dream, realizing that my mind was moving my body. That means my body was asleep on the bed, but my mind gave me the experience of experiencing a body I could move in the dream through. So the mind was literally doing what physical reality was doing. Isn't that weird, guys? The mind is... The mind is, you're, you're, you don't dream yourself as like something else. Your dreams are kind of like related to some context, some storyline, some story, story way of perceiving it. Do you know? <clears throat> what I'm saying is that there are certain dreams where characterhood holds in that dream. You're still like you in that dream. Guys, I feel I experienced this rare moment in my life where... I had a dream and I like am, I think it was like 2009 where I would constantly wake up in the morning and I would have sleep paralysis and I would have this moment where my body would feel so heavy to me and later on I realized it's because the body creates this chemical that makes you so that when you dream of running you don't actually run in your bed 
<coughs> so the body strangely kind of sedates itself and when it sedates itself the body becomes locked down and it's like the mind gets to live its life so here's the cool thing i think deep sleep is the only sleep i think dream states are not sleep that means the fact that we think we sleep and we dream is not accurate i feel deep sleep is sleep i feel a dream has still format to it and that form relates to activity so i pretty much noticed that the mind is living a life and that's what i'm saying when you realize you're not a thought that life of your mind like settles like ripples on a pond and then you see the reflection of the stars you know in the pond you see the stars in the reflection of the pond I'm telling you guys, it's an advantage. We are conditioned to think we all need one kind of rope to get out of like a, a swimming pool that's not even like that shallow, whether you know how to swim or not. It's like you just have to step out of that state of mind. And it's not easy, but in some sense you can direct it. So I've, ha I've had moments where I've just closed my eyes and whatever image has come has literally instantly translated into a geometry and that geometry has a sort of animate movement so i've experienced the literally i'm not doing i'm not using any energy i'm just watching i'm just watching geometry in my inner realms animate uh without a mind do any with a, like a chaotic expression it's like the, they, they're like, what did you see beyond the veil, man? And the guy's like, dude, it was too chaotic. Literally, it was so meaningless. I can't even give it meaning. <laughs> and think of it this way. If truth is meaningless, that means when, you re when there is less meaning, you feel the reality is true. But if, re meaning, if truth is, let's say, meaningful... Then the more reality is filled in it, if, if, if filling up, you feel meaning is that. So meaning is literally how, where your attention is pointed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, guys, it's super easy being a human being. Just pilot your attention. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, guys, I'm pretty much going to um, leap into a poetic segment where I'm going to pretty much read certain poetic, like these mystical hymns I wrote in 2015 and 16. I don't know why I feel I should do this, but I'm just going to do it. Let me, let's see what, what, uh, voice from the past wants to find the now. Okay, so guys, this, this part of the episode is audience interactive. Um, pretty much in 2016, I wrote this um, <clears throat> poetry book called Eternity's Flight. 
Now, I would appreciate if um, people listen with ears as if, like, this poetry is its own world. Let me just check something, guys. Okay. 36. So, guys, one out of 36. So, three people can choose out of one out of 36. And I will uh, choose one of these. I will choose, like, that poem to read out of this whole poetry collection. All right, guys, let me see, 27, let's see what number 27 is. When anger comes down. <laughs> so how I've spelt it is W-H-E, no, no, not, like when anger, and then the, it comes down, I've written it as C-O-M-E-S. So it's like a play on words, you know, like you, an angry person calms down. I was like, when anger comes down, like, like down the stairs. You know? <laughs> <clears throat> when anger comes down, calms down, C-A-L-M-S, when anger calms down, how does intelligence remember the innocence of its purity? Sorry guys, I need more epic music in the background to like read this. <laughs> um, let's go attack on Titan soundtrack. <laughs> When anger come, uh, calms down, how does intelligence remember the innocence of its purity? We all think we are smarter than thought. But could that be another thought? In silence and stillness, the world knows it turns. Even the Buddha looked in an empty mirror. When isolation gives the crowd something they have never seen, how does joy make the calligrapher become only his brush? Joy makes man more manifest than he can plan. If you don't trust yourself, at least trust the world. For then you will realize the world is within you and you have already trusted yourself. Give love to others to find it within self. When anger comes down, rise beyond thought. When anger, C-O-M-E-S, down. When anger comes down, rise beyond thought. That's, that's, a, that's how, that rise beyond thought. Those three words are literally the next paradigm slogan of the evolution of the human being. And I feel the third phase evolution, most likely the cyberspace is going to find us. It's going to be a cyber kind of cyberspace evolution, third third kind of evolution where man's creation and nature's creation infuse. <clears throat> Anyways, so that's the poem I wanted to read. Let's see what the audience has said. Number eleven. Number 11 for It's All In Your Head. Okay. Guys, honestly, the chat names are so creative. It's ridiculous, you know. 
<laughs> um, all right, 11. Let's see what number 11 is. Who dares distract me? That's the, that's the name of the poem. So, number 11 is Who Dares Distract Me? <clears throat> this is from this poetic world, a uh, work called Eternity's Flame. It can be found like in the, on Amazon, I guess. Who dares distract me is the name of the poem. So here it goes. The external earth is the internal heaven. The shoreless ocean is how nature waves endlessly at itself through your nature, through your nature. Do not be burdened by transitory dreams. You are the heart of all awakenings. Desireless abide in the self of selves. Once you no longer avoid the void, causality shall become the friend of all effects. Who dares distract me from my, from my true nature? For all phenomena passes through the omniscient glory of those changeless few who stand with existence as purity. Who dares distract me from my true nature when I am eternal glory? That's the, that's who dares distract me. That's the poem, guys. Guys, two, <clears throat> we need two people to kind of write numbers and then, um, the, I'd feel, I, I, I'd feel like I've honored the audience engagement portion of the segment. <laughs> <clears throat> so from numbers 1 to 36, two people can choose. Hey guys, we got a number. Number eight. Let's see what number eight is. <clears throat> when the seasons pass you by. That's the name of the poem, guys. <clears throat> when the seasons pass you by. Number eight is the poem. Who stands knocking with temporal fingers upon eternity's door? What makes gold wonder if silver has a value before the alchemy? Such words are only here to give truce to the seeker within. Do not underestimate the roots of the tree even though they cannot be seen. For the branches of knowledge may think the fruit only comes from them. But those who know they are connected to all life are free beyond words. You are not just here, but everywhere that consciousness allows. The playful are, are the first to be revealed. The secrets of destiny. So, guys, that's the key. Be playful and the secrets of destiny will... <laughs> The playful are the first to be revealed, the secrets of destiny. Who can be so nameless that the origin of all names is the here and now? 
When the seasons pass you by, what is truly alive cannot die. What, that's the last sentence of it, guys, when, like the last two. When the seasons pass you by, what is truly alive cannot die. All right, guys, one more number. All right, guys, let's see. Let me see what number five is. So this poem's called Glory of the Transcendent. Glory of the Transcendent. I think that I really feel this is the last thing I need to read. <clears throat> and by feel, I mean literally it's open in front of me. Like I feel I should be. <laughs> Glory of the transcendent. So it begins. <clears throat> Be aware of your moment for death and life come hand in hand. Once the beloved has caressed your forehead, do angels belong to the future and demons to the past? If time was a puppeteer, are the strings made of space? The moon is not to blame for a lunar eclipse. The Son of God is brighter than destiny's whims. Be so pure that your moment by nature is the glory of the transcendent. The Son of God is like S-U-N. The Son of God is brighter than destiny's whims. Be so pure that your moment by nature is the glory of the transcendent. I feel like I should read this other one too. It's called Your Cosmic Magnificence. It says, okay, let me change the song here. <coughs> Excuse me. Your Cosmic Magnificence. Can you achieve what you cannot? Are these words the edge of a mountain cliff or where the peak kisses the sky? Some solutions are as temporal as fading clouds and greater lights. Let us consider that behind our eyes we are all gods that know beyond themselves. A poet that writes with no thought has become best friends with the empty page. Perhaps then your consciousness will have always been absolute. For some kids can clean a poker set just to see life is not a game. Do not deny yourself your cosmic magnificence. That means realize the value of how you're alive right now, how you're here. What greater gift than eyes open to change? That means when I think about it, if we want a belief system that doesn't change, that's non-existence. That's scary. You know, that's freaky. That's like wanting the whole world to be a painting all the time. <clears throat> to be one painting. It's like we don't want to. A belief system is like the whole universe is like we're living inside a painting. But beyond the belief system, we're a process of the generation of minds into attempting their potential at an advanced civilization. And my whole attempt in these talks is 
uh, draw people's attention to what I call Civilization 2.0, that we have to begin caring for the transformation of reality, and it's literally we have no choice. Literally, we have no choice. We have, uh, it's literally like a pattern that repeats in history. Certain beings in history, they don't feel great. Certain beings have no choice. They, they get so bored of how much, how long they haven't been great and efficient that they just become efficient. It's like the next step, really. The idea is that when you live in this life and give yourself a freedom it's like this it's like if you don't give yourself freedom who will like well how can you expect it from others it's the same thing like if you can't forgive yourself how are others gonna how, why should others forgive you do you know if you can't take care of yourself why should others take care of you you see what i mean after some point you just the mind becomes conscious of itself <clears throat> the subjectivity realigns to the actuality of how now uh, the process is aware, the particle is not, thoughts will appear as, as stuff moving in the river of the mind, you know, and like, like as if your, uh, your, your awareness is how your mind is being space and yourself is how your mind is being your body, how your bo mind is being matter. We are, we are the navigation between the two. And it's so fragile. It's so fragile that we're literally like balloons that are not even tied. And the moment the human body, it's so fragile that if it goes after a certain elevation, the opportunity suddenly drops. So I feel that there's two possibilities to the future. We open our eyes and we see a future that is working or we see a future that isn't. And when I say working, pun intended, both functional and the second actually caring to do something here while we're alive. We must realize the value of every person's eyes having a value. That means imagine specifically as a, new, a sort of new picture of a civilization where all the governments were like, yo, we're going to go to the people and be like, you human being, you're a valuable member of society because you have a unique DNA and when you look at society, that reflection has the value. So if people become part of the process of building the laws, they will listen to the laws. When the people are not part of choosing the laws, they, they feel it's like it's the, their free will have nothing to do with it, so it feels like a push from outside of their will. But rules are necessary because we're creatures that are oscillating between the known and the unknown. <clears throat> so, with, so it's like in, you need to practice discipline and freedom. So anyways, guys, I'm going to open it up to the Q&A and pretty much the talk is over. If anybody has a question or anything for like a few minutes, I'm going to be around and then I shall go forth and see what life is like. <laughs> Honestly, guys, this is the best way I could say how we can find a collective efficient vision. How we could he all of us suddenly start hearing the greatest symphony of mankind. <clears throat> where our kindness defined the kind of beings we were. And our kindness is kindness for an advanced technology. That means if you, uh, if you don't have compassion for like, <clears throat> uh, for, you know what I mean? It's like next level. It's like the Dalai Lama having comp compassion for like the laws of science, you know? And he's like literally there with the scientists and the scientist is like, what do you, what do you believe old man? And the Dalai Lama is like, yo, laughing at this man's foolishness. <laughs> and so you see, it's like the Dalai Lama is literally, you got to see people as they grow older, they become more stoic. So as you endure more in this life, your behavior dictates your truth. But when you're younger, you can see beyond your conditioning and how, how there's a sort of behavioral program going on with being an individual. <clears throat> For me, it's, it's, it's about the evolution of language. It's not about 
us seeing a miracle. It's not about some supernatural event. It's not about extraterrestrial contact. It's not about like rebelling against the system. It's not about hidden shadows or bothering us. It's 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 all just a, a system where we are the we are the life of the system. And if we don't care about our individual life, and if we don't care about our collective life, we will lose sight of it. Let me tell you something, something that most people should realize. Uh, Alan Watts spoke about it as the polar thinking. He talked about it as polar thinking. I speak about it as the two dimension, the dualistic dimension, and I say that language is a technology that's dualistic. The reason I say that is because I don't want people to think they are their thoughts or they are not their thoughts. I want people to begin to realize language, communication, speech, the classification of ideology, how whatever happens to you in life, there's some, some, some part of you self-processing. Do you know what I mean? Like you, you will suddenly realize your power in, a, in the only stage that you can discover it. That means like there's no point. After some point, you will ask yourself, who am I waiting for? And you will realize literally that uh, um, uh, the future is waiting for you. And, the few, and an advanced civilization is waiting for you, dear listener. If you exist in this world and somehow are hearing my voice talking about an advanced civilization, most likely you're some person who in your community will want to, could notice some things. And the idea is that only become responsible when you have control, right? So don't take responsibility for things in life where you can't control. That's like a sort of wisdom on its own. For example, if, if you can't drive a vehicle and you're not at the proper consciousness, literally accept it. Be Zen enough to be like, okay, this is, a, you know. For me, it's all about the archetype. So what does that mean? That means people don't just get feelings. There's no such thing as just happiness or sadness. There's a picture behind there eyes of the person when they feel happy, happy or sad. The inner realms are moving in some way. It's just that happiness is a sort of alignment of the planets in that moment. There's been moments where, like, guys, I remember I saw this girl that was so beautiful that literally I felt I just stopped breathing for a second. <laughs> and it, it's like, you know what I mean? It was a moment where my where the phenomenology in my eyes made my emotional selfhood shift. You know? <sighs> Guys, just to stay true, just to honor my poetry book because of its efforts. <laughs> you know, I'm going to share the link. <laughs> What's the thing here? Guys, I think Eternity's Flame, like now when I look back at it, that's an incredible name. Eternity's Flame, who knew? Eternity was on fire. <laughs> oh man, sorry guys, I'm feeling a bit silly because I'm, I, I probably need more sleep. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, that's when you know when you need more sleep, when you're like, what is sleep anymore? <laughs> When you become a philosopher of sleep, that's when you know you need sleep, you know? <laughs> oh, man.
<coughs> All right, guys, here's the thing. In case if anybody wanted to go check it out. So anyways, guys, thanks for listening. Um, one last thing I got to say. You see, we are rat creatures that have access to rational decisions and irrational decisions. Irrational decisions technically are not irrational. They are just rational in a realm that is deviates from what rationality has been accepted as. Do you see? So you are a human being and you are your attention before you are the thought in the attention because we learn language. So before all your beliefs and ideologies on everything, you were just a baby in, in a room looking. Like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like you were just a child that hadn't learned language yet. You were just, just, your mind was just being the moment. Then it began finding the sophistication. So I feel the child actually when it's born, at, at the moment where air begins to move in its lungs, that child's mind is being the world. That child's self is literally the world, the moment. There's no, in two, there isn't any need for searching. It's like, it's, it's like, it's like, <clears throat> it's like asking like, you know, <laughs> it's like getting a time machine and going back to when you were like, like 10 months old and be at being like, how's the truth seeking going? It's like, you don't even have a personality yet as, as a human being, you know? <laughs> so anyways, guys, thanks for tuning in. Let your vision be your guide. Your eyes are, I remember saying this, there's no, the idea of the ex, any sort of external teacher or guru, all that. It's like, you know, this isn't ancient India, guys. Right? <laughs> and I'm going to tell you what that means. The external guru's task was to make the person aware of the inner guru because the ultimatum was not for the person to become attached to a conditional access to the truth. You have to find a way where you can actually see what your mind is. And it may appear to you in your inner realms as an eternal phenomenon. It may appear as something void, you know? You may feel like free will doesn't exist, but then you may feel you had the free will to see that it didn't exist. You know, so it's about states of being where there's multidimensional presence uh, or in states where there's a sort of singular personhood and personality. So we're oscillating between this kind of suggesting that psychology is being ushered into an era where philosophy and psychology are going to soon infuse because the intensity of the effects of a more advanced technology entering civilization is going to suggest this. What does that mean? That means you give more speed, you, well guess what, the, the, a single turn of the car is going to be more intense, right? So certain technologies that get momentum, their sudden shift will have intense kind of echoes and whatnot. So anyways guys, thanks for tuning in. Go forth and see what life is like. Every moment happens once. Every day happens once. Uh, a lot of human life is, is kind of left in the inner realms. Don't fear the externalization of it. The whole point of evolution is that our eyes see more than yesterday. Watch blessings and honesty.